Welcome to Short Circuit of Brewers. Our channel is all about electric brewing. We do electric brew days, product reviews, and how-to videos just like this one. In the fourth part of our electric brewing series, we're going to explore a rim system, primarily a rims diagram, and we'll get to that right after this. Okay, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started with the video. Number one, I'm going to say it again, I'm not a licensed electrician. Always consult your building codes. If there is any question, hire a licensed electrician to do any electrical work around your house. This video is meant for entertainment purposes only, and you know I don't accept any liability from anything that's in the video. In this video, we're going to explore the rim system and some of the components of the control panel, mainly the wiring diagram itself. Uh, a lot of the principles in some of our previous videos can be applied to this same video. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about primarily before we get started, uh, and you know, I appreciate Doug uh, creating these diagrams for me. Um, really appreciate your help with it. It's certainly, I think it's helping a lot of people. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to everybody that subscribed and also, you know, thank you for all the comments, the thumbs up, all the comments on Homebrew Talk. Um, it's just, it's been, you know, the, the series seems to be well received. So I really appreciate it. You know, keep telling, give me ideas, keep letting me know what you don't know so that, uh, you know, if I don't know what I can find out, we can learn together. So one of the things that Doug did in this diagram that I think is key is that he created a loop in the system so that when you have any component on that shouldn't be on, when you power up the panel, you cannot turn the actual power onto the panel and do damage to any pumps any elements, any other of those vital components to the system because you'll be, they'll be locked out of the system by the way that this loop is made. So that is one thing that is very vital. I can tell you from experience that myself, when I first started doing the rim system brewing, I had one of those days where I was out in the garage. I had my system out there at that point. It was a three tier system. I had, you know, I had my electric kettle, I had my cooler. Everything was going good. Had everything up to mash out temperature, turned the pump off and then forgot to turn off the element. And the only way I knew what happened was I heard what sounded like a boiling and crackling sound. And as soon as I heard that, I immediately knew what it was. I had scorched the ward in my rims too. It was awful, it was terrible, it was a horrible smell. I ruined the entire batch of wort that I was making. I was just, I was pretty much heartbroken. I mean, I was about ready to throw in the towel, but. I, I didn't throw in a towel, obviously, but you know, it was one of those heartbreaking moments where you're just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. So if you don't take away anything from this video, please take away that principle. It's not a lot of extra work to do it. Uh, it's just adding a couple of small components to it in order to make that work that way. But please take away that at the very least from this. One more thing I wanna cover in the video before we get into it. The last episode was about wiring and connectors and all that sort of thing. In this diagram, we've got three different sizes of wire. We've got 10 gauge wire, and that is primarily for your elements and all of your higher voltage, your 240 volt uh, higher amperage, I should say, actually, too. Um, and then you've got your 16 gauge wire and you've got your 20 gauge wire. So a lot of those connectors that we talked about in the last episode correspond with those wires and the reason why they correspond with those wires is because they are built for the amperage that those wires can withstand. So you know you've got your 10 gauge wire and it has the amperage range. You've got your 16 gauge wire there's another amperage range for that and then you've got your 20 gauge wire and it has an amperage range as well. So those connectors are made specifically for those gauges of wire because they're made you know with the this proper amount of metal the proper amount of shielding, the, the capability to handle all that amperage. So this is one of the things I wanted to clear up from the last video. And with that being said, let's jump into the components of the, the wiring diagram. All right, so let's review some of the key components of the control panel design. On this particular build, we incorporated a key interlock, just kind of another safety mechanism for controlling the, the panel, allowing you to turn the power on and off via a key so someone couldn't accidentally turn the system on and cause damage to a component or hurt themselves or whatever. After that, you've got the main contactor, then the main pump switch, and that's just a typical switch, just like we've listed in the other videos before. 
there's a main power indicator. Then you've got the rims pump switch. And what's important to note about this is it is part of the interconnect system that keeps the pumps and elements and all the other components off on the system when you turn it on. You don't want to have any items on whenever you turn the switch on, otherwise you could damage an element or damage a pump or, you know, etc. There are some blocks that need to be added to the bottom of that switch and those will be listed in the description down below and those can allow you to do more than one function with a switch. Most of the switches come with a normal open or normal closed circuit and we utilize those in this diagram to make sure that things that shouldn't be on or off whenever the system is powered up. The rims element power switch. Then we've got the RTD probe and XLR connectors for the rim vessel or the rims tube, depending upon how you're going to use the system, whether it's a second vessel or a rims tube. The PID and buzzer. The buzzer is optional. We're listing a DSPR 300 with alarms, and if you don't want to use the buzzer, you don't have to. You would just swap that out for the DSPR 120. Added fuses for protection. Um, you want to make sure all of your low voltage circuits and pumps and everything are protected by fuses so that those are present in the system. There is a RIMS element contactor, and that is a relay switch that is powered by the RIMS tube or RIMS element switch itself, and that is what actually provides power to the element once the switch is turned on. Then you've got the RIMS SSR. Then you've got the RIMS element plug and indicator. The element power on lamps are necessary. SSRs typically fail to the on state, and a lamp that is on when it shouldn't be indicates an SSR failure. So that's a point to note if you have an SSR that you know is not turned on via a switch and the light is on, most SSRs do fail to an on position. So the lamps do come on if the corresponding element is not plugged in sometimes. That would be an artifact caused by normal SSR leakage. Uh, also to note, we did use different plugs for the rims tube versus the boil kettle so that there's no confusion between the two. Then you've got the RTT probe for the boil kettle, the boil kettle switch, the boil kettle PID and optional buzzer, the boil kettle contactor, and the boil kettle SSR, and the boil kettle element and lamp. And that pretty much rounds out all the components for the system. When the power to the panel is turned on, the circuit flows through, goes to the main contact of the main switch, and then I'm exaggerating the diagram and having all the switches on to prove a point about the loop. So when the first pump switch is turned off, the circuit flows through to the second switch, and then once that switch is turned off, then it will flow to the third switch in the system. And then when that one is turned off, it'll flow to the fourth switch. And then when the fourth switch is turned off, it will actually flow to the main switch. And then it makes a contact throughout the system on the other side of the main contactor switch. And then when the main contactor switch is thrown, then it turns everything else on. I'll dim the diagram just to show the rim circuit loop as well. So the, the rims pump being off, the switch is off. No power is flowing through. Now, whenever that switch is turned on, then this circuit will complete through the rims element power switch, the contactor, and then once the PID receives a signal, it will send it to the SSR and turn the element on. After that, we have the element power switch for the main element in the boil kettle. When you're ready to boil, that works the same way. When you turn the switch on, it feeds the power to the contactor. The contactor completes the circuit to the element. And then once the PID sends a signal to the SSR, it fires and the element is powered. Although it is pretty complex, it is a fairly simple system when you break it down into all the separate components. It's just a matter of wiring it correctly and having your switches configured correctly. In this video, we really didn't cover a lot about the boil kettle and we really didn't cover a lot about the control box. There are some options for the control box. Auburn Instruments has a box that will allow you to put two PIDs, two SSRs in it. I'll show a picture of that here. As far as the rims tube, there's a lot of different options for that. I would recommend personally that you get an option that will allow you to take the element out periodically without a lot of trouble in order to be able to clean it. Not necessarily because it gets a lot of wart buildup on it like a boil kettle element does, but because there's you know bits of grain and husks and everything that can can get stuck in the rims tube. And if you can't take it apart and clean it out, you know, there's a good chance you can get some funkiness in there and you know that's just that's just not good. So 
Um, there's a ton of different examples of rims tubes. I mean, there's, you know, tri-clover, there's, you know, stainless steel pipe, all different kinds, tri-clover fittings, cam lock fittings. There's just so many different options that, you know, I couldn't possibly cover them all. That's going to be kind of up to you guys. So, um, if you like this video, give us a thumbs up, please consider subscribing for more content and, you know, let me know if there's anything else you want to see. Where do we want to go next? Do we want to go with a Herm system? Do we want to talk about induction brewing? Do we want to talk about, you know, heat sticks in an existing uh, propane system to convert it over? There's been some discussion about that. So you guys let me know what you want to do next and uh, we'll try to bring that content to you. So this has been Brian for Short Circuit of Brewers. Until next time, we'll see you.